I went to Berkeley. I got on my first plane ride of my life, knowing absolutely nothing. 17 uh-huh. years old. Uh, had been, I used to think Los Angeles was Northern California. I had been nowhere. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'd probably been on a plane when I was very young. I somehow, I, there's, I appeared in Maine once or twice. I must have been on a plane, but I don't remember it. Um, and I just kind of got out and went to, went to Berkeley and uh, got, so you, got you, socialized. You went to UC Berkeley as an undergrad? I, I did, yeah. I didn't know we had this in common. Yeah, we used to swim with Bert. That's right. The same I, Greek pool. The, Nietzsche said the best thing about having a bad memory is that you get to experience the same thing many times for the first time. And I'm, uh, I'm one of yeah. these people. Well, <laughs> so I get, I get the, the delight of learning something new well, every time, over and over again. <laughs> every time. So we're talking about Bert Dreyfus, by the way, yeah. for those that uh, haven't seen Tao's films already. But uh, he has prosopagnosia, right? He doesn't. He has face blindness. So we would yeah, swim I and I'd occasionally, it would just be like in the you know post-swim uh, showers. And I would just be like, hey, and I'd just chat about Heidegger and he just would have no idea who I was. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, you're supposed to use it like prosopagnosia because you use other like tics and body cues and things like height and hair color and various different like formal features of your body or face. Uh, but he just had no idea who I was. And, and but he, eventually once he knows you, like once, yeah, once you know somebody, I think I have a mild version of that. And I think it's hereditary because most people in my family don't recognize people and people always insult, feel insulted but it's yeah. just like I literally have you know introduced myself to somebody I remember at Berkeley who lived on my same floor and was like my neighbor and we saw each yeah. other every day and I, I it's not it can't be it can't be totally egocentrism it's got to be like something wrong with my brain I, I hope <laughs> not just well, total it, self-absorption well it, it first of all I mean we know it's something in the brain because it extends to more than just faces and people right it's it's for houses and objects and various different things like people people have difficulty people with prosopagnosia will walk by their own house mm-hmm. not recognize it interesting but I what I so usually they use like kind of like clothing cues or style right people mm-hmm. people might think that they're mimicking other styles but they do tend to have some unique like pattern palette mm-hmm. uh, and so what I found interesting about Bert Dreyfus kind of never recognizing me is that we only saw each other in speedos or in the in the like large communal showers right. in, at the at the Greek, and uh, so there's like Bert less... Dreyfus for those who don't know is my mentor at Berkeley, and he used to only half jokingly say that he uh, uh, created me or made me because I was just a young. Uh, lost undergrad studying architecture because I thought that that would, was a practical way of mixing creativity and seriousness because I fancied myself the serious one in the family. So I was studying architecture, but I never had a particular passion for buildings. I just thought it was a kind of default decision. And then uh, there was a class being taught that I took as an elective. I always liked philosophy in, in high school reading Bertrand Russell and um, I saw this class called Existentialism in Literature and Film. And I walk in and there's this funny little eccentric redheaded man named Hubert. And, uh, and I was just so taken by what he was saying and how he was saying it and his passion for philosophy and the fact that philosophy could be, uh, you know, found in books and films as much as, and if not more so than in a philosophy, traditional philosophy text. And I just changed my major to philosophy and I took all his classes and uh, just basically became a filmmaker because of him. And so he was a huge, huge influence on me. And then 10 years later, I went back and uh, made a film inspired by him and his thought called Being in the World, which everyone, he, he was so humble that he just attributed all his thoughts to Heidegger. And obviously Heidegger was a huge influence on him, but a lot of people called it Dreidegger because he was obviously infusing so much of his own thought, but he just didn't have the ego of calling it his own philosophy. He didn't need the credit. Yeah. We should, we should, I feel like we should do an exercise and try to describe him visually for our audience members who don't want to have to look him up as they're listening to this, because if we're going to keep talking about him, they need an image. <laughs> yeah, so he had head. this little, he has little, uh, you know, red, yellow, red and yellowish, blondish, reddish blonde, strawberry blonde, I guess you'd call it mustache and kind of just five foot two maybe and kind of wiry and uh but, but, but importantly he's very like, cute <laughs> importantly five foot four or like whatever it is just minus two because of the kind of like just uh, a closedness you know the the halfway to fetal <laughs> <laughs> well so i mean uh anyone who's seen futurama right yeah it's 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 the the, the creators of that uh, went to Berkeley as well. Yeah, so Eric uh, Linus Kaplan, who is one of my favorite Twitterers, uh, 
is uh, was the PhD student at, while I was an undergrad, and he was one of the creators of Futurama and Farnsworth. And he made Farnsworth based on Bert Dreyfus. Right. And like I think one of the guys, one of the professors in uh, in Being in the World describes him as a, an amusing looking character, <laughs> and 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 to kind of underline also how how bold and and uh, his stance was when he was at MIT kind of challenging the computer science department when from the philosophy department saying that the artificial intelligence program that they had embarked on was going to fail because they weren't up to date on the latest philosophy yeah, about what it means to be exactly. human and what it means to be intelligent and and uh, and he's like you know already the 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 um philosophy department was probably seen rather dismissively by the people in the more, you know, hard sciences uh, and, and engineering departments at MIT. And the fact that this like amusing looking character was telling them that they couldn't do what they were doing. It was just really offensive to them. He was a kind of cartoonish character before he was literally a cartoon. <laughs> character. Literally a cartoon character. Right? I learned, I learned, I remember learning something about power from him. So, so, I didn't I didn't have much experience understanding what it was like to be in front of a room. I hadn't seen enough kind of lecturers, right? Mm -hmm. It's a bit teachers, but yeah. that's different than a lecturer, someone who's commanding a room and kind of having the only only monologue, effectively monologuing. Nobody in Coronado monologued. <laughs> and and so I would study how the professors engaged attention of their of their uh, students. And were you a philosophy student? Yeah. Yeah, philosophy, English, and cognitive neuroscience. Oh, okay, great. Um, so, I mean, I took Bert's class just because being in time uh, seemed daunting. And I loved the idea of spending uh, uh, six months dedicated to a single text. Uh -huh. Like I, you know, have zero spirituality or religion, but I think I m people miss out in the secular world on that devotion to a single text yeah. that yields like immense fruit. Mm -hmm. If like around month three, you feel something very, very different about that, about that book. Um, but so I, uh, there's one professor, for example, <clears throat> um, he, he was a poetry professor and he started class exactly on time, ended class exactly on time, took no questions and paced just back and forth, left, right, left, right, like a metronome, the mm -hmm. entire class, the entire hour, always holding a coffee cup. Nothing, I, I could tell by kind of the weight in which he held it, that very little liquid was actually in it. So it appeared to be empty. It appeared to be a prop. And what I noticed, because I would always sit in the back of the room because I was young and just observing things, um, uh, I noticed that every at some point the entire class was entrained to every single time the professor took a sip from his empty cup of coffee would free permit the students to then take sips from their cups. And so I watched this like ripple wave after the professor would sip of like row by row, the students feeling uh, either obliged or free. Those are interesting, different, interesting, that similar, suggest. but different uh, 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 personality uh, uh, um, preferences. But uh, so, so then the, my question for Bert was, how does Bert command a room, right? Mm -hmm. How does he uh, uh, kind of small, but he, wildly intelligent, humble, quiet, doesn't have an ego, isn't directly commanding attention. And he did a thing where in a room, in a given room, you can try to rise your bo voice above the room, but he would just start talking at a whisper or like at you know the entire cacophony of young students coming in and rustling and making all their noises. And he would just start talking like without raising his voice at all like this, just in a very calm, just like go into it. And instead of trying to outcompete the room by speaking louder, he set the bar here and then everybody fell into place. And I realized that like, it's just- I've got chills. I, I just hadn't thought of, analyzed that way. And it's so true. The way he would just like, just start talking as yeah. if, and everyone was just so interested in what he had to say that they just, there was this, yeah. Very good, very good. Go on. Well, and I just, uh, you know, it's, it's this interesting thing to, you know, I guess you wonder, so like, to what degree are we lecturing right now? To what degree are yeah. we, you know, to what degree are we in a, like a virtual kind of uh, room with whoever future person is listening to this? And are we guiding their permissive freedom structure to do a thing when we pause or when I take a sip of my coffee? Right. You know, is someone watching that and, and, and just kind of like subtly mimicking this without even realizing it? Yeah.
I don't know. How does one? How, it's an, it's this dynamic of the podcast thing is very different because you lose all that feedback. You lose all of that like room control. You lose all of that in person kind of communication. So, A lot's happening. There. The, one of the things that I most influenced me besides Dreyfus and uh, and studying philosophy at Berkeley was living amongst the uh, flamenco, the gypsies who make flamenco in, in the south of Spain. Some people who don't know about flamenco might think of it as a uh, kind of classical music or a folk music, but actually it's most akin to uh, jazz or blues in our culture in the sense that it's like a, the expression of an oppressed people uh, that's based on you know, a lot of improvisation and very much tied to a lifestyle uh, and, and a kind of ethnic group. And um, it's kind of, I, I like to think it has the, the complexity of jazz and the em raw emotion of blues mixed together. And then a little bit of classical influence in the guitar. So it's like really rich, rich, interesting tradition. But there's been one of the things, the reason I brought it up is that they have a kind of really intuitive um, distaste for being recorded like mm. uh, there was uh, a there was kind of a proprietariness like there was one guitarist in the early flamenco days in the 1920s who mm. if he, he saw people in the audience with a long fingernail indicating that they were a guitarist too he would play badly on purpose because he didn't want them stealing his material so even recorded in someone's memory counts as being recorded yeah even that like <laughs> they wanted it to keep their originality and the and the mystery of the original experience right. and 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 i remember as i loved recording so i would bring my camera around and i i would talk to these guys who were also naturally very philosophical and uh, and poetic and i would ask like why you hate being recorded and they said i hate the i remember one guy said i hate the idea of someone listening to me in a context i don't know and that i can't i, yeah, I don't know yeah. i can't respond they're responding to the room they're responding to this so the idea of taking that and plopping it into somebody's car as they're driving and having a conversation was right. so deeply offensive to them Absolutely. and understandably uh right. so, so then the, someone could be using this as a solve to get out of their mind in rush hour traffic and 2023 right <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i'm okay with that for some I reason too, I yeah too. But, a, but then but we're not we're not like bearing our souls maybe in the same way but maybe we will be one of these i've just watched the uh, um did you watch the podcast of uh joe rogan with um uh david i did oh, david cho anyway i just i, I that's this is part of what also instigated wanting to do this is that I, this conversation between these two men was so raw and so powerful and so vulnerable and like um i realized this is a medium that can be really deep and expressive and it maybe is, and well, it's, it's and it's okay that people listen to it in the wrong context it's maybe. as close to the thought as you get right like just you speak to yourself all day every day the little internal monologue and now like yeah, just you just let it all out how much thought do you think uh, depends on uh, on language and that inner monologue is it all of it or well, this is one of the problems I think with like artistic communication or, or that, that kind of need to control how the audience will perceive the thing that you're either saying or producing, mm -hmm. right? Um, people are going, like there's this book, uh, What We See When We Read, and the guy uh, uh, grew up in Boston and he read a lot of Tolstoy. And he writes about how he would always just imagine Anna Karenina and War and Peace and all the characters and all of their liaisons and affairs happening within the streets and roads of Boston. Mm -hmm. Like, like they got superimposed on the structure of the streets that he knew. And so what that means is like, imagine Tolstoy writing, you know, would he be careful? Every once in a prefer... while, you, see that, you hear that little pop sometimes it's going like deep into the red. Sometimes when you, is that I think the you just scream. Yes. I think when you go, it's not happening on this one, but it is happening there. You see it right there. Yeah, yeah. And I'm worried that because we're not monitoring what's actually recording there. It'll sound like a chirp. It might. So just, yeah, just be slightly, maybe just back off just a tiny bit off just the mic. less enthusiastic. No, no, no. Be enthusiastic. But when you're enthused, like back <laughs> up, you know, deep. those great singers who know exactly oh, when to yeah, like yeah, yeah. bring the mic forward and back. <laughs> uh, okay, go on. Try. So this, this desire for control is interesting because you have absolutely no idea how another mind is going to interpret, see, visualize, hear the thing that you're trying to produce, right? And and yeah, I, th I think, so even just linguistically, like what this does, so I find it interesting. I've written some things and before they come out, 
uh, I'll give drafts to friends that I know. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, and I don't know how to undo this. They hear it in my voice. When they read it, they hear, they, they read it and, and something inside their head is speaking in something that resembles my voice, which gives an unfair advantage to that draft text because the person knows me and it comes with the like constellation of memories of me speaking and all of our interactions. But what would it look like if I gave it to someone and it was completely anonymous? Like what, what voice do they hear in their head? It's yeah. not going to be my voice. Yeah. It's going to be perhaps theirs, some, some amalgamation of them and everyone they know, like, is it some middle ground? Yeah. And so it's so hard to control that. And I love control. If, 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 uh, if I was on a plane and the pilots simultaneously had like a stroke and passed out in the cockpit and nobody on the plane knew how to fly, had zero flying experience. I would absolutely go up there and be the one to try to fly mm. it. Like I do not want to die by someone else's right. lack of whim and lack of experience. So I, I, I immensely crave control and it's so hard to put out any kind of art and know that the reception of that is completely out of your control. And this is just a small degree of that. Even lecturing, it's completely out of your, your control whether or not you have a little bit more data if the person's right in front of you. But in general, you just got to throw it out there into the into the universe I, and hope I, it gets soaked up. I'm curious about, though, this idea that we that it seems like all of my thought is the the the, the monologue. And I'm, I sometimes I try and see if I can have an experience of what it would be like to have a, be a non-linguistic animal, you know, like a dog or a cat without any language. And so just can you even have 10 seconds of like walking around and just experiencing the world around you without that? language and mine, didn't. mine never goes away right yeah my my inner monologue is constantly on i mean so so, you so do can, you think that constitutes thought i do i think i think 100 percent. no I, I think there are people that have uh that are strikingly visual mm -hmm. and when they close their eyes and imagine or remember it's like much much richer than others mm -hmm. um i mean i've i've gone around asking people recently uh what what happens, like what's going on on the inside of your head? Just like, what's it like in there? It's yeah. incredible. I've done so many interviews for all these kind of like nonfiction essays and journalism things that I've done. And there is no question better that uh, to elicit better answers than just like, hey, no, no, no. We're not going to talk about the thing you know well. We're not going to talk about other people's ideas. We're not going to show off. We're not going to present. Um, we like just what, what's going on in there? What's it like? And And to try to actually get at the part about their inner mind that is unique to them. It's hard to get there because language explicitly is meant to be able to communicate and is meant to mask and hide those uniquenesses. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to talk to each other because right. it's all so different in there. And some people report to that, like what we see when we read problem of like, how does Tolstoy control the fact that some guy in Boston is just going to put all of his characters on the, the corners, the corners of Beacon Hill. Um, like as a writer, as a, as you, this question applies to you as a musician, like how, does it bother you that your music might be heard differently than you, that the thing you're trying to communicate, because effectively you're trying to communicate something that's some deep emotion, right? You were in here yesterday because your heart was ripped in half. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I've done it too. And, uh, <laughs> right. But the, like someone listening to that, uh, uh, someone listening to that might not get that emotion and yeah. the question we, we're so used to reading inference into the mental state of the, the the person who's speaking displaying presenting whatever so so i do think people have significantly visual thoughts uh i but i but i on an evolutionary level i think the thing that allowed us to have the kinds of thoughts that allow us to think about thinking 100% it's purely linguistic. It is a vocal learning. We are one of like half a dozen vocal learning species, which means you can coordinate the, the sound that comes into your ear with a very, very rapid feedback loop that can include output, that includes yeah. movement. Uh, it's like parrots, uh, songbirds, hummingbirds, seals, maybe an elephant. There's, it's literally like half a dozen. And then humans, we're the only primates that can do it. And this is not a magical feature by fiat from above it's just a neurological like loop that was added to our ability to learn what we hear there there are, there are birds for example that can um that can 
that can that can mimic right they have yeah. a song it's like their song it's their species song and they can sing it and they sing beautifully but they can't learn a new song but there are a subset of them that can learn a new one and that loop just add another one if you if that same loop that allows them to learn let's say you just add another one suddenly now you can learn about learning now you can have another layer to train the, the learning and when we have our internal monologues, I really think all that's happening is we just have a few extra of these kind of uh, motor learning loops and just at some point pops into existence all of the inner monologue of language and the fact that we can speak to each other in our minds. We can have two different people. We can have a conversation, an entirely simulated conversation. And we're doing this all the time, right? Do you ever have the staircase wit? Like we were hanging out last night, right? Hey. Uh, did you, when you came home, simulate counterfactual versions of the evening how it might have gone or what you might have said or at certain points maybe not last night but I obviously i do do that all the time yeah right so so that why it does yeah. we don't we don't ask our brain to do that the brain yeah. just does that it's just simulates. it's, it's the way we learn right it's the way we learn but it's funny that's the way we learn fictionally we 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 come up with these counterfactual like oh i should if if only i had said that at that point yeah. i would have been uh, uh, perceived by those in the room as wittier because yeah. that's my ultimate goal. Yeah. Uh, but what that fundamentally is is a linguistic simulation, right? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about this. What you were talking about, uh, being able to communicate the the emotion of a piece of music, for example. And this is a lot what being in the world of film. To keep coming back to that, but what it's about very much is how we require skillful engagement with the world in order to have uh, meaning, and. Um, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, you, I might spend all day, you know, repeating a little mechanical, uh, you know, riff on the piano and somehow that becomes a, a, a medium of both like engagement that feels meaningful and deeply emotional for myself. And then that happens also to the listener. And I think according to Heidegger, that would be dependent on a shared history and culture and like you know it's uh, unlike sartre who uh dreyfus said was you know being in nothingness was just a thousand page misunderstanding of of being in time because he thought we were just absolutely free and that, that everybody was just free all the time to make any choice and like um i think that this is gonna it's tricky not to like go on to a long tangent but the the um the contrast is that you actually need a shared culture of uh, unspoken understandings in order to have that kind of uh, shared meaning. And so I think that when the person plays the piano, um, whether it's an improvised piece or a piece that we both know, um, there's this background of, of a culture and memories that we share that if you just brought like somebody who had never like been in a Western culture, they might just hear noise, right? Like the, or, or when we hear a foreign music that we've never heard, it might be take, it takes time to get accustomed to it and have it not be discordant. Right. And, and then I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, the, the pianist also then betrays what he's feeling with his face. And you could probably tell if it's too performative or just done for effect versus if they're actually feeling something and that then that elicits a similar feeling in you by just this, some sort of sympathetic response. Right. Um, anyway, yeah, it's, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about in that, in that realm. So, uh, the sun shone having no alternative on the nothing new. It's, Explain. It's this Beckett. It's the first line of Beckett novel I think uh -huh. the first line of his first novel what does that mean to you the sun shone having no alternative on the nothing new what happens in your head when you hear that like close your eyes like how how say it one like, more time the sun shone having no alternative on the nothing new I don't know it's like yeah it's very in a way it's it's I, I, what, the fact that you told me it's Beckett probably influenced this kind of Not bleakness sure. to it <laughs> right <laughs> There's there's a certain certain like fatalist. No, bleak, not the interpretation. Uh, not the interpretation. What ha like what happens? Well, I I I 
this, it's, it's a weird simultaneous thing because I think of like a, a, a new day, I think of sunshine. These are positive things. But then when I just like think about the meaning of the sentence a little bit more, it turns darker in a way. So I don't, it, it's like, an, it's, and then and then it's just the, the, the idea that I, I get a sense of kind of repetitiveness from it. And that, that that's it's just like, a, there's nothing, just the sun is, it, and, and the fatalism. I don't know. <laughs> how rich, I bet you imagine a sunset, a sunrise. And is that yes. sunrise here in Joshua Tree? Is it no, a, no, I just imagine just it? the sun appearing over a mountain. Yeah, and then it's like Italian? everything being kind of, no, I imagined Italian a more bleak side. landscape. <laughs> not an Italian mountain. Side. No. Not Joshua Tree. Where, where might it be geographically? You know, it's funny. Like, I was too influenced by the fact that you told me Beckett, so I suddenly had this like vision of like Endgame or waiting for Godot of just like just like a kind of very minimalist, nothing like landscape. Yeah, very yeah. dreary and bleak, and then the sun just shining on just nothing new. So maybe I just imagine like a kind of or Antonioni kind of like just like a bleak landscape. Like a stage play of just <laughs> repeated every day, the showtime every day, nothing has changed. Yeah. What do you, why, why do you memorize the sentence and what, what does it evoke for you? Well, it's one of my favorite just uh, uh, strings of words of all time. Um, uh, I love that uh, if you look in his notebooks, you can see all, he spent years coming up with that sentence and you can see the like eight to 12 versions of it, you know, oh, wow. that, that got nixed. Um, and and it's, it's amazing that, uh, you know, seven of the eight are just kind of average, but he found the one that is substantially, substantially above average, which is the one that the final one that was used. I find it interesting because if you look at these uh, visual imagination, like questionnaires and inventories uh -huh. that are used in neuroscience often, the thing that they ask is um, visualize the sunset. How similar is that sunset or sunrise to uh, what it's like to actually see it? Like, like put it on a scale between zero and four. Uh, uh, how similar is it? And people have such different answers. Uh -huh. And like the fact that you gave a linguistic interpretation rather than describing the, just the, you didn't describe the trees, you didn't describe the horizon, you didn't describe how, how much of the sun had risen. There are people that will very, very much respond very differently to, to what happens in their head during that. And so the, the, the attempt to take your musical piece and show it to the world i think you're going to have a similar variance across people and like what happens to them when they hear it yeah some people will interpret it because they're overly linguistic some people maybe have prosopagnosia and aren't going to be able to imagine uh beckett's face or the face of an actor who might be staging the play or something yeah and it's just like we have such little access to other people. It drives me mad. I want. I want. But in, I in want jazz and flamenco, they say you, the listener is at, needs as many skills as the as the player. That's almost. Nice. I like that a lot. You that know, like they a, need to. Yeah, that should be the tagline of the whole fucking podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I always think it should be your Beckett sentence. But listen, I know you have an 8.30 uh, 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 breakfast, so let's. I think we wrap it up here uh, for now. And I think this was really fun. Yeah. And and I think the, the idea of doing it every morning, even if it's sometimes just a half an hour, yeah, yeah. is a great start to We're the day. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Patrick. Okay.